We will read the first lesson, John 12, 20 to 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And he said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just as a single grain. But if it dies and it bears fruit, those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of the world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw people all people to myself. And he said to this, to indicate the kind of death that he was about to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Eunuchs came and told her. The queen was stunned. She sent fresh clothes to Mordecai so he could take off his sackcloth, but he wouldn't accept them. Esther called for Hathak, one of the royal eunuchs whom the king had assigned to wait on her, and told him to go to Mordecai and get the full story of what was happening. So Hathak went to Mordecai in the town square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him. He also told him the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to deposit in the royal bank to finance the massacre of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the bulletin that had been posted in Susa ordering the massacre so he could show it to Esther when he reported back with the instructions to go to the king and intercede and plead with him for her people. Hathak came back and told Esther everything Mordecai had said. Esther talked it over with Hathak and then sent him back to Mordecai with this message. Everyone who works for the king here and even the people out in the provinces know that there is a single fate for every man or woman who approaches the king without being invited, death. The one exception is if the king extends his gold scepter, then he or she may live. And it's been 30 days since I've been invited to come to the king. When Hathak told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai sent her this message. Don't think that just because you live in the king's house, you're the one Jew who will escape out of this alive. If you persist in staying silent at a time like this, help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from someplace else, but you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for such a time as this. Esther sent back her answer to Mordecai, go and get all the Jews living in Susa together. Fast for me, don't eat or drink for three days, either day or night, I and my maids will fast with you. If you will do this, I go to the king, even though it's forbidden. 
If I die, I die. The word of the Lord. First church, the more things change, the more things stay the same. In today's story surrounding Esther, we meet the children of Israel in exile. It has been 100 years since the Israelites were forcibly taken out of their homeland. A few, like Nehemiah, have been able to return. However, in the town of Susa, the capital city of Persia, lives more Jews. The book of Esther begins as the king of Persia has a banquet that has been going on for 186 or 187 days. Just one second. The king is drunk, impulsive, murderous, and immature. And after months of drinking and showing off his grandeur, the king calls for his wife Vashti to come out to greet this guest and show off her beauty. Vashti refuses to entertain a banquet hall full of drunk men. She says no, and the king banishes her. The king begins a search for a new queen, a young girl named Hadassah, at the request of her uncle Mordecai, uh, because her parents have died and she is in his care, enters the contest. And however, she must hide her Jewish identity. Thus her name is changed to Esther. I'm sure Mordecai was just hoping that Esther would become one of the concubine and then he wouldn't have to worry about her eating and drinking. But Esther wins the contest, and the king makes Esther the new queen. Meanwhile, someone who hates Esther's uncle and all the Jews decides they must all be exterminated. <laughs> the more things change, the more things stay the same. The enemy of God's people persuades the king and gives the king finances for his treasury in exchange for all these lives. Word spread throughout the capital and God's people were understandably distressed. Uncle Mordecai comes to the king's gate of the palace in ash and rags and Esther's eunuch is not able to persuade him to put on the clothes that Esther has sent him. The king is a man of privilege, and the distress of others is not allowed near him. Therefore, anyone in a state of despair was not allowed in the king's palace. Mordecai pleads through the eunuch for Esther to go to talk to the king. And Esther responds through the eunuch that there is a law if you disturb the king without being requested, he may put anyone to death. And it has already been more than 30 days since the king called for Esther. But Uncle Mordecai tells Esther not to believe that she is safe in the palace while her people are slaughtered. If she does not advocate for her people, help will come for them from somewhere else, but things won't be good for Esther. Her uncle wisely states that perhaps this young girl was called for such a time as this. Can you imagine Esther, a young Jewish girl living in a godless palace with a drunken, murderous Persian king? What do you think life was like for her? Esther had to deny who she was and adopt the culture and values of the king. Esther, a young girl with no parents, found herself living among strangers. Is it possible? Esther wondered what was her purpose among people with such different values. 
We learn from Esther that sometimes God allows us to stumble clumsily into certain places for God's reasons. Perhaps you are called to that job, ministry, community, family, for such a time as this. Have you considered that God can call any one of us to spaces and places where we were not expecting, and he may do it for a greater purpose? But a beautiful part of the story for me, and I hope you agree, is the last part of chapter 4 in Esther. Finally, we hear Esther speak. We hear this young woman speak. Esther has a voice. In a book that does not often record the words of women, we finally hear from a woman named Esther. Esther, the former orphan. Esther, the former girl pushed into the king's court by her uncle. Esther, who has who must hide her identity from everyone, including her husband, we finally hear the voice of Esther rising from this ancient text. Esther takes command. She calls a fast for all people. Did you hear me? An orphan, a woman, not a priest, not a prophet, a woman called a fast for her people. She tells them to pray because Esther has decided that some laws just need to be broken. Esther says, if I perish, I perish. In this crisis, Esther comes of age. In your crisis, what is God teaching you about yourself? What is God revealing to you about God? In the book of Esther, we learn even when God is silent, God is active. Esther addresses the king. Esther reveals her identity and pleads for the lives of her people. Esther rises to the occasion and the people are saved. There is a more recent voice of a young woman rising from the pages of history. At the Boston Women's Memorial, Phyllis Wheatley is resting a finger against her temple, frozen and pensive, she stares out to the back bay. At seven years old, Phyllis found herself kidnapped on a slave ship bound from West Africa to the Americas. The ship that brought this seven-year-old to America was called Phyllis from whence she gets her name. The ship was for men only, and somehow this little slither of a girl was placed in this horrific vessel full of men and journeyed across the ocean. By the time little Phyllis arrives, she's sickly, and the Wheatley family in Boston purchased her for domestic service. The family began to marvel at the child's intelligence. And in addition to learning how to speak English, little Phyllis quickly learned how to read and write, and then she studied Latin and Greek, and Phyllis became a poet. Can you imagine what life was like for this little girl on a ship of men for months at sea? Can you imagine her leaving the shores of West Africa, passing the Caribbean and the American South because she was deemed too frail to, for field labor? So this little girl ends up in Boston, and little Phyllis has no voice. Phyllis has no ownership of her own body. 
she has been trafficked. And while the Wheatleys did educate her beyond the education of most Americans at that time, men or women, Phyllis was enslaved by them and still worked for them as a servant. In terms, it turns out that Phyllis Wheatley has written almost 200 poems for publishing. And like Esther, Phyllis was aware that her people were dying unjustly. Like Esther, Phyllis had to be careful how she addressed those with power over her. And yet Phyllis risks life and limb to address the king of America. Oh yes, America was under British rule. The colonies had a king. His name was George, <laughs> George III. If you go back into the hallway, you'll see the scroll that we keep here where another King George gave this congregation permission to even worship on these shores. So in 1768, Wheatley writes, and her poem is published, to the king's most excellent majesty, that's the title, in which she prays King George III for repealing the Stamp Act. And Phyllis takes the chance to address the king about her people in print. At the end of her poem, she writes, and may each climb with equal gladness see, a monarch's smile can set his subjects free. Can you imagine? This enslaved young woman found a way to address the king about the situation of her people. In some of Phyllis's work, it is said that Phyllis sweetly considered the why of her toil. <clears throat> why didn't she die at sea as so many others? Her poem titled, On Being Brought from Africa to America, opens with, it was mercy that brought me from my pagan land. For over 200 years, scholars have argued and misunderstood that line. And now it is believed that this enslaved person had to use the same methods of communication as those who made the spiritual song sung on the plantations. You couldn't just come out and say it. You had to be subtle. It turns out, brought me from my pagan land was code for brought me out of the Atlantic Ocean. Young Phyllis found her voice in poetry and told the colonies and Europe that her people were human and deserved equality. Church, the more things change, the more they stay the same. An eco-activist and scientist named Vandana Shiva of our present day says it is time for our planet to understand that we are one planet and one humanity. This is a quote. The billionaire class are the same 1% with a disposable view of humanity beneath them. It might have different shades, but it is the same old human problem. Our planet, our beautiful living planet is interconnected. They pretend our planet is dead so they can exploit and plunder. However, Shiva goes on to say, the earth is rising, the young are rising, the women are rising, the workers are rising, the unemployed are rising. All we need to see in our, is our commonality so that we can move past this idea of south, north, 
white, black, Muslim, Hindu, men, women, all these are constructed divisions of one common humanity on one planet. Child of God, will you rise with the workers around the world? Will you rise with the oppressed around the world? Will you take the side of the 99%? In this season of war, poverty, famine, and injustice, will you rise? I wonder if Esther and Phyllis Wheatley were with us today, what would they say? Esther rose to the risk and dared to address the king. Phyllis Wheatley rose to the risk and dared to address the king. Now what will you do with all that has been given to you? Will you stand on the shores of this planet's history and rise? In closing, with this poem inspired by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, humanity will rise. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still humanity will rise. Out of the huts of history's shame, all humanity will rise. Up from the past that is rooted in pain, because of Christ, humanity will rise. Humanity is a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling because of Christ, humanity will rise. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear all over the earth, humanity will rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. Humanity will rise, bringing the gifts that our ancestors gave by embracing the reality of an interconnected planet of human beings. We become, we all become, the dream and the hope of the exploited and enslaved. in Ireland, in Scotland, in Poland, in Germany, in Czech Republic, in Hong Kong, in India, in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Great Britain, in Israel, in Palestine, in Mexico, in Haiti, in the Congo, in France, in Chile, and in Albany, and in Albany. Amen, and God bless you.